huge day. Last few days, you can see a big move in the Russell 2000, but we are flat today. 10-year Treasury yield was down earlier today, but has come roaring back, currently up three, three additional basis points now, 1.77%. Talk about that in just a bit. Volatility index continuing to drift lower. Earlier today went below 14. It is down about two and three quarters percent. Materials leading to the upside along with technology. You can see technology trying to make a breakout above the high just uh, earlier this week and, in, and last week. Um, not too far from that July high as well. Uh, so if the market's looking to break out, a breakout in technology certainly would help. Consumer discretionary also making a move up, trying to challenge those July highs, having another uh, very strong session today. Energy, on the other hand, had been very strong earlier this week and really last couple of weeks, but we are seeing a little pullback, although we are off earlier lows. I also have pointed out five different industry groups that have been leading the market in 2019, uh, but they really struggled in the recent, um, uh, just earlier this week when we talked about the shift from growth stocks to value stocks, they're starting to lead again. I don't know if this continues, but at least we're showing a little bit of leadership today. Restaurants and bars, nice rally off of yesterday's low. You can see that 2000 level has been support. So far that's holding. Non-durable household products making a nice bounce off of its 20 day moving average, not far from a breakout. Consumer finance down three days in a row, but it is rallying back today, although you can see a little bit of a tail there uh, bounce or falling back off the earlier intraday high. Financial administration stocks down four days in a row, but we are rallying today. And then finally, medical equipment. This was actually a big reversal back on Tuesday. Nice day yesterday. Challenged the high earlier today before seeing some sellers. So very, very interesting times indeed. A lot of these aggressive areas, though, beginning to show a little strength. Hopefully that continues. Aaron, it is Thursday, getting close to the end of another week. How's it going? <laughs> it's going well. Um, with the technical difficulties, I might sound like I'm coming out of a hole, but at least you can hear me, right? I'm having no problems whatsoever. Sound pretty good. And we've oh. also got, yeah, we've also got a very special guest today, John Murphy, joining us. John, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for inviting me. It's always great having you on the show, and I know uh, you know you've got a market message to go over, and hopefully we'll have a little time to talk about this shift between growth and uh, value that we've seen this week. Do you have any, I don't know, words of wisdom for everybody out there? I mean, is this something that you think could continue? Do you need more time, more, more evidence on the charts? What are you thinking? Well, I kind of hope it continues because we've had s some really beaten down sectors of the market, and you know what they are. We'll talk about them later. Financials, really the big ones, small caps, transports. Uh, the Russell and uh, the transports, they're very economically sensitive groups. They've been lagging behind for a long time. So I think it's a good sign that money is starting to rotate into those groups. But at the same time, I think that, that maybe there's a cautionary note in there that some people that maybe want to put some money into the market now, you know, instead of putting it into uh, technology and groups that have been leading all year, are now looking for maybe safer areas or cheaper areas, I should say. So there are different, a couple of different ways to look at it, but I think it's kind of a good thing. Yeah. I, well, it's always good to see you know full participation in a bull market. And like you said, those areas have been lagging for a while. So it is nice to see them finally coming to life a little bit. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, if you can just stick around maybe for five minutes or so, we'll get, uh, we'll get you in here and you can share your wisdom with everybody. Does that sound good? Sure. Absolutely. All right, uh, let's go ahead and jump in. There were a couple of economic reports out this morning. The uh, CPI, I'll show you the 10-year Treasury yield here, and you can kind of take a look at this big reversal. I'll talk about this in a minute. But CPI for August came out. It matched expectations, rising one-tenth of 1%. Core CPI rose three-tenths of 1%, which was slightly above the expectation of two-tenths of 1% rise. Initial jobless claims came in lower than expected, 204,000 versus 215,000. Now, I did go through and annotate this again, just, to remind, just as a reminder for everyone. We did see that yield continuing to fall throughout August, but at the very bottom here, and that, and that bottom at the uh, beginning of September, came with the PPO beginning to rise on the 10-year Treasury yield. So we had a little bit of a positive divergence. I look for the momentum to the downside to reverse at that point and to what I call reset, with the PPO going back to the center line, very similar to what we saw back here in June when we had the yield moving down and the PPO starting to turn back up. Now, whether or not we get through that, I think uh, I think that's going to have a big impact on what happens to some of these financials, especially 
banks and life insurance companies, asset managers, and so forth, some of the areas within finance that have not done very well. If we can get through and begin to show some momentum, positive momentum in the yield to the upside and clear some of this overhead resistance that I've marked, I think that that could be a very good sign for financials, maybe industrials, uh, some of that, those areas that have lagged, as John was just pointing out a couple minutes ago. We'll see whether or not we make that move. I think if we fail there and start to roll back over, then I think if we're going to see leadership, we'll probably see it continue in the form that it has been, you know, that we have seen throughout 2019 with the yield falling. But we'll have to see how that develops, I guess, uh, before we go further. Uh, there were a couple of earnings reports out overnight. We had Oracle reporting last night. I'm going to update this, get the latest here. Uh, but Oracle did report they came in and met expectations on their bottom line, 81 cent versus 81 cents. Uh, you can see the reaction, not that great. I was holding out some pretty good hope on uh, Oracle back in the early part of July when we started to move higher here on a relative basis to other software stocks. But you can see since then, the volume had kind of dried up, had a little spike in volume heading into earnings, but another disappointment. So I'm not quite sure what to, to say here, except I think there are still other software stocks that look better to me than Oracle. You can see here on a relative basis to the S&P 500, Oracle is now moving to about an eight to nine month relative low. I don't think that's a good thing. And we're also seeing relative weakness in software, although I'm really watching closely at this low here in June that we had, uh, that was after we had all that weakness back in May on a relative basis in software, we put it in what I think is an important low, moved higher, and now as long as we can hold that low, I think we're okay, but uh, still a lot of work to do there. ACB Aurora Cannabis came out with their earnings. They came in slightly above expectations. They met, or they came in at a uh, flat uh, reading on their earnings per share in the last quarter. Market was expecting a two cent loss. So it was a little better than expected, but the reaction, not very good. And when we look at the relative strength here on Aurora, it has been really bad relative to the pharmas, relative to the S&P 500. And I think it's been, you know, maybe showing some signs of uh, a further deterioration to the downside. I just would like to see some more relative strength here in ACB before uh, I anticipate it going any higher. The uh, last one I wanted to mention is a smaller company. This is Oxford Industries. Stock had been going up here, but with its earnings coming out, they missed on their bottom line, buck 84 to a buck 86. Stock was starting to show some relative strength. It moved up to about a six, seven month relative high versus clothing and accessories. The problem is that clothing and accessories overall has been a downtrending group. So not great area uh, so far uh, falling back, but I would watch that rising 20 day moving average to the downside. One uh, other chart I wanted to mention was restaurants and bars. I talked about this at the open. After breaking out late July, we pulled back, held 2000, put in a number of tops here around 2100 came back to 2000, now starting to bounce. I'm still looking at sideways consolidation. Although if we fail at the 20 day and roll back over and uh, fail to hold that 2000 price support, I think it would begin to really give more credibility to this thought that maybe money is rotating away from some of these growth areas. All right, uh, John, it is time. We're gonna bring you in. I know uh, Aaron, uh, if you would like to go ahead and work the uh, screen for John. I will take a look at maybe one of your recent market messages, John. Yeah, Aaron, uh, Aaron, if you wouldn't mind, um, I did, wrote two messages yesterday, one in the morning about interest rates. Uh, can you find? Uh, no, this not that one. It's the one just before that one. There you go. Thank mm -hmm. you. You're very welcome. I just wanted, I wanted to start with this. I actually wrote this yesterday morning. I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, this whole thing about interest rates, and I wanted to build on something that Tom just said. Evan, if you just go back to the headline there, I just want to read it. Um, there you go. A uh, 10 year treasury yield is bouncing off major support. You know, you all, we all know that uh, bond yields have plunged all over the world over the last year. And that has caused a lot of concerns about the global economy and the American economy. Um, and the whole point of this is to show that we're, we're, uh, we're bouncing off major support. Also the bond stock ratio has run into resistance I'll show you a second, uh, and that suggests that um, the pendulum may switch back to stocks now. That would favor stocks over bonds. Also, recent sector rotations show a shift to more economically sensitive stock groups, while bond proxies weaken. What I'm trying to say there is that um, there's been a lot of concern in the market with falling interest rates, 
uh, and money has been in defensive sectors, a lot of defensive sectors. If if I'm right and if bond yields start to stabilize here and bounce a bit, that could be that could explain a lot of the rotations uh, that are going on right now. But let's go to the first chart there. Uh, this is uh, chart one. This is the yeah. This the this is the ten year treasury yield. This was plotted yesterday morning, but nothing has changed since then. It's the TNX, and as you know, as I mentioned, all over the world yields are negative in Europe and Asia. The the thirty year yield uh, recently hit a record low, but this is. This is a, one that I'm following, and I think a lot of people, this is the real benchmark that I think a lot of people really follow. And you can see this is a monthly chart. It's very simple. It shows the uh, the recent, the plunge that really took place uh, since the end of last year from over 3% to under 2%. But the point of the chart is simply that we have come down to the lows uh, that were formed uh, in uh, 2016, 2012, it's been pointed out many times, by the way, the record low in this thing was set in um, middle of 216, just below 14. So we're just above that. So just looking at the chart here, it looks to me like this is a logical spot for the yield to start bouncing a little bit. I, I'm not bold enough to say this is the bottom or it's the beginning of the major upturn. But I do think that the fact that we've come down into major support suggests that this decline has been overdone. Uh, it's very oversold. At the very least, I think bond yields may start to bounce from here. Maybe they'll just trade sideways for a while. But it suggests to me that this uh, this downturn in bond yields is overdone for now. Uh, and by the way, the the line, the box just below that, this is the nine month RSI. We use that to determine overbought and oversold areas. And you can see that little circle down at the bottom here. The RSI is at the most oversold level in, in more than a decade. So that, that kind of feeds into the idea that not only are we in an area of major support and we're very, very oversold. So it just tells me that bond yields are, are overdone here. And I think we're gonna bounce around here a little bit. And I'm not saying this may be the bottom. I don't know, I, I, I can't say that. But I do think that uh, this has been overdone. And if I'm right on that, by the way, that's going to change uh, a lot of a lot of perceptions on the market. Uh, but before before we get to that, let's move to the next chart. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Uh, let's let's continue with this. This is uh, what I'm doing. I do a lot of ratio analysis. I know Tom does, uh, all, everybody does a lot of this, uh, combining two asset classes in this particular case. TLT, that is the 20-year uh, the treasury bond ETF. It's the longest maturity that we have. And that has done extremely well this year. In fact, it's done better than stocks. This particular chart is a ratio of the TLT, which is the long bond ETF, divided by the SPY, which is the S&P 500 spider. And you can see, for example, uh, during the fourth quarter of last year, when the ratio spiked, that took place when stocks lost almost 20% and money rotated into bonds. Uh, we all know what happened then. And uh, it's a flight to safety. But the ratio fell during the first half of the year as the stock market recovered, the Fed started lowering interest rates, money moved out of bonds and back into stocks. Right around the end of April, the beginning of May, when some of these tariff concerns started to develop, we've noticed that bonds have started to do much better than stocks. We saw that during May and June, we had a stock sell off during May, but really the, the, the most dramatic part there was late July, early August, you can see a real spike, again, tariff concerns. And as you know, the stock market sold off during August. During this whole period of time, bond yields were just plunging all over the world. But the point of this chart is simply to show that bonds have been doing much better than stocks over the last couple of months. But just applying some very, very simple chart analysis, we are right up against the highs that were formed at the end of last year. You can see the two circles. And that to me is a resistance, looks like a chart resistance. It's just very simple basic analysis suggests to me that the um, the rotation into bonds i won't even say out of stocks but rotation into bonds has been overdone here and it looks like it's starting to weaken a little bit so again it feeds into the idea that um, that bond prices have probably rallied too far relative to stocks and as you can see they're starting to slide uh they've slid over the last week so bonds are now doing have done much better than stocks over the last week. And again, uh, that also feeds it, feeds into the rotation. Not only are stocks starting to do better than bonds, but 
Money is starting to come out of bond proxies like uh, consumer staples, utilities, and REITs. They've been market leaders for the last few months. Uh, they're starting to weaken a little bit. And again, if I'm right on this, this would also support a move into more economically sensitive areas of the market, which we're beginning to see. But uh, Aaron, if we could move down to just the next chart, and I'll finish up with this little treatise here. I just, I got carried away with this. I just wanted to take a longer term view of this. This is the same ratio, TLT, which is the long bond ETF divided by the uh, S&P spider. And I've gone back to the last 10 years, basically, and I, I've drawn a trend line in there. Uh, you can see uh, pretty much contains most of the peaks of the last, uh, of the last uh, 10 years. And I just wanted to make the case that this recent upturn in the bond stock ratio is right up against the trend line going back 10 years, which also kind of supports the view that this rotation into bonds is very much overdone. We, I'm not saying we've seen the end of it, but I think it's overdone for now. And I think we're going to see uh, somewhat of a retracement. So all of which suggests that the decline in bond yields, the rally in bonds is, is somewhat overdone. And I think we're gonna see some retracements of that. That's basically good for stocks, I think. But uh, it's also, it also tells us a lot about sector rotations. So if we'll continue moving down uh, to the next chart, uh, I just wanted to comment on this, uh, the idea of sector rotations. The, the, um, the first chart there, chart four, this simply shows the sectors, I went back over the last year, uh, just to show what has been happening. Remember, bonds have done better than stocks for most of this year, okay? But look at where their leadership has been over the last 12 months, real estate, utilities, and consumer staples. That is, those are, those are defensive groups for one thing, but more importantly, these are dividend paying stocks. When bond yields are falling, and remember they started falling during the fourth quarter of last year. When bond yields are falling, uh, money does tend to, investors are looking for yield. So within the stock market, they move into the highest yielding sectors, which are staples, utilities, and, uh, and what's the other one, REITs. So I think that there's been a lot of concern about moving into defensive sectors. I think in this case, it's more a matter of investors just looking for yield. The fact that they're safe uh, is maybe secondary. Technology stocks, also had a pretty good uh, pretty good year. We'll come back to that. But if you look at the bottom of the chart, you can see what's been lagging behind. Energy stocks have been very weak. That's because of a very weak uh, um, oil group. Material stocks have been very weak. They're very much they're very closely tied to economically sensitive commodities like aluminum and copper. So weakness in energy and weakness in materials is a sort of um, a sign that investors are concerned about. Um, the health of the global economy. But also look at a couple of the others there, financials, industrials, uh, laggards. They, they've been laggards over the last year. Financial stocks do not do well in a climate of falling interest rates. And of course, industrials are very economically sensitive. So you can see that over the last year, the, the rotations have favored bond proxies, defensive stocks. They've kind of stayed away from uh, financials and uh, economically sensitive stocks. Now, if you go down to the last chart, uh, the point of this is, I did this yesterday, so there have been already been a couple of changes in this. I just wanted to show that over the last week, uh, everyone's been talking about these rotations, and I just wanted to show it graphically. Again, this was done yesterday morning. There have been a couple of changes. Energy, right off the bat, is at the top of the list. You know, energy got off to a very strong start. That's going to probably fall off very quickly, because as you know, energy stocks are taking a hit today. But the, but the ones I really want to focus on are financials. Remember, financials and industrials have been two of the weakest groups over the last year. Financials and industrials are now uh, two of the strongest groups. Financials, um, financials are very sensitive to the bounce in bond yields. The minute bond yields started bouncing last week, and they bounced almost a quarter of a point, believe it or not, uh, financial stocks have done very, very well. So they've gone from market laggards to market leaders, bank stocks in particular, are extremely sensitive to bond yields. So if bond yields are bottoming here, or at least stabilizing, or at least starting to bounce, uh, that should be very, very good for financial stocks. And by the way, financial stocks are the biggest part of the value universe. So when people are talking about this rotation into value, it's mainly financial stocks. Now, industrials are right below that. 
Uh, industrials have also done very, very well. Uh, I showed a chart last night, and I think Tom showed one this morning, of the industrial spider, XLI, is right up against its old highs. This is the fifth time in the last, uh, I don't know, 18 months that we're testing that level, and it looks like we're going to go through it. And industrial stocks, very economically sensitive. They do include a lot of uh, trade-sensitive stocks uh, that, that did very well yesterday. But I also want to point out that, that in the XLI, transportation stocks are a big part of that. And as we've, we've all, a lot of us have been showing, transportation stocks have done extremely well over the last week or two. They've been one of the strongest parts of the stock market. And that has had a lot to do with the rally in industrial stocks also. So financials, industrials, and by the way, I, I think I've already mentioned small caps. Uh, within the small cap universe, um, small cap value is where the biggest gains have taken place this week. And 30% of that is financials. So this big surge in the small cap universe that we've seen this week, and I hope it continues, I think it will, has a lot to do with the surge in financial stocks. Just to repeat, the, the, uh, the Russell 2000 value uh, ETF, which the symbol is IWN, 30%, 29.8% of it is financial stocks. So you can credit the, um, the, uh, the rally in financial stocks has a lot to do with the rally in small caps, which has a lot to do with the rebound in interest rates. If you look at the bottom of the chart, you go down to, now again, this is, uh, has changed a little bit over the last day or two, but I just want to point out REITs, REITs have been the weakest part of the, uh, you remember over the last year, REITs were the strongest. They're now the weakest. Remember, these are the dividend paying stocks. If, if bond yields are starting to bounce, and it looks like they are, these are the groups that you should expect to see profit taking in real estate stocks, utilities, and even consumer staples. And we are beginning to see some of that. So there is, there is a sort of a rotation going on uh, within the stock market. And I think the key to it is the fact that uh, bond yields may be scraping bottom here. Also bear in mind that um, that decline, I'm, I don't want to sound like an economist, but uh, the, uh, that decline in bond yields has increased concerns about a slowdown in the global economy. And if bond yields start to bounce, I think that would relieve some of those concerns and might encourage investors to, uh, to put some money uh, back into the more uh, aggressive sectors of the stock market, more economically sensitive. And I might mention, uh, I think Tom mentioned this before, as you know, the ECB lowered interest rates this morning again, and uh, they announced a new bond buying program, and bond yields in the U.S. and Europe opened sharply lower, as you would expect, but they are bouncing right now. Bond yields are up right now. So I found that very interesting. Even, even the euro, the currency markets, the euro dropped very sharply. In fact, it hit a multi-year low this morning on that ECB easing. But last time I looked, it was having a big upside reversal then. So it could very well be that uh, a lot of this, we know what the ECB was going to do, and most of us have a pretty good idea of what the Fed's going to do. I think a lot of this is baked into the market. So this idea that bond yields are going to keep dropping because, in, because East, uh, in, uh, central bankers are easing, I think a lot of that is, is baked into the cake at this particular point. So, hey, John. Hey, John. Yeah. Oh, yeah, John, go ahead. Um, first of all, you're a mind reader. I literally had jotted down a question about the ECB and what they were doing and how that might impact the Fed. And as soon as I uh, turned the mic on to ask you a question, you went into it. I was like, wow, that was, that was pretty good. You must have been uh, reading my mind. I had a feeling you were thinking about that, Tom. I just had a feeling. <laughs> so as far as the, um, the Fed, of course, they meet next week. And with the ECB lowering or cutting the rate and deposit rates and, and you know, more bond buying, more QE. Um, what do you think that sets up for the Fed next week? Do you think that that puts pressure on them, them to lower again with everyone? Well, I, uh, I think it does. I think it does, Tom, because, um, well, well, let, let's put it this way. It does in the sense that, you know, we can't allow the foreign central bank to keep lowering interest rates, and we don't because that would strengthen the dollar, and we don't, we don't want that. So I, I think the general feeling is the Fed will ease by about a quarter of a point. Uh, when I looked today, that was about a 90% chance of uh, Fed funds futures were predicting about an 89% chance of a quarter point. What they do after that, I don't know. It is interesting. I'm sure the Fed is watching markets very closely today because the last thing that they would want to see 
is the euro plunge to a multi-year low because the euro has the biggest impact on the dollar. That would push the dollar sharply higher. The fact that the euro seems to be turning up today is that the dollar was actually down on the day. So that may, uh, that may uh, take a little pressure off the Fed. But I think that a quarter point cut is probably uh, what we're going to see next week. Yeah, one, one other thing, too, that uh, has seemed to reverse with, with the 10-year Treasury yield moving up like it has is we've gone from that yield um, inversion uh, from a slightly negative. I'm talking about the 10-year versus the two-year. And now it's been on the rise now for the last couple of weeks. And we're no longer in that inverted uh, yield curve. Any thoughts on that? I mean, that obviously is, obviously is helping the financials as well. You're absolutely right, You're absolutely right Tom. So and I, I have, I've written a little bit on this, and I, I have to admit I – I'm a little skeptical of uh, skeptical of this inverted yield curve. I, I I did write an article a couple of weeks ago saying this time could be different, with, which is the worst thing you could ever say. But uh, because you know historically, whenever we've had an inverted yield curve, every t- every uh, time I've seen this in the last 70 years or so that I've studied, every time we've had an inverted yield curve, it's because the uh, the Federal Reserve has raised short-term interest rates to combat inflation. We're not seeing that this time. This this time, uh, and so as a result, short-term rates rise faster than long-term rates, and we get an inverted yield curve. This time, nothing's going up. They're all going down. This time, it's not it's not a question of short-term rates going up. It's a question of long-term rates falling faster. I've never seen that before. And I think a lot of this has been caused by the central bankers themselves. Uh, the EC, all, all these economies of the ECB today just going deeper into negative territory. You know, this has never before, been done before in history. <laughs> you know, they're flying blind. They have, they have no, no uh, workbook to go to. So I think these central bankers just keep going negative and negative, and they're pulling our rates down. And I think this is distorting the yield curve. So uh, I'm a little skeptical of that whole inverted yield curve thing. But you are right. It is encouraging to see that uh, long-term rates are back above short-term rates. Yeah, and I, I just think that there's no denying – the fact that with bond yields negative in so many parts around the world, that there's a lot of money that's coming into the U.S. because we do have, you know, among the highest yields uh, worldwide. So I think all of that money that's coming in that's leaving foreign uh, treasuries is, I don't want to say that it's temporarily sending our yields lower, but it kind of is, in my opinion, sending our yields lower because of the, all of a sudden, the surge in treasury buying. And I don't know that that's an indication that we're looking at a weaker economy ahead. I mean, if you look at the jobs and the and the um, rate of change in jobs, we almost always see that begin to roll over before a recession. I would say, actually, we always see it roll over before a recession, and I'm not seeing that. So I'm kind of in that same camp with you. I don't, I think this time is different, and I hate saying that as well, but I see, I see almost a bubble type scenario with all of the bond buying that's been going on around the world what happens as we've seen here in the last couple of weeks what happens if that money begins to come out of treasuries and starts to move back into equities i i think we look we're looking at a rally ahead i just that's just my opinion well that that's my point to come back to this that if bond yields are bottom here and i i think they are i'm not saying a big upturn but i think we're, we're seeing the bottom for now um i think that um a lot of money has gone into bond prices over the last six to nine months. I think some of that money is going to start coming out. And where is it going to go? Uh, some of it may go into gold. I don't know. But I think a lot of it will move back into the stock market. So I think the pendulum for now, for the time being, is going to shift away from bonds uh, back to stocks. And I think not just stocks, but within the stock market, I think it's going to move out of these defensive uh bond proxies, and I think it's going to start moving into the more economically sensitive areas. And two that, I, that I've mentioned already this week that I'm really focused on are, I mentioned the financials, and I mentioned industrials. And by the way, just to come back to the small cap thing, Tom, kind of pre-associating here, I'm looking at the, uh, the Russell 2000 value index, which really exploded this week. Uh, the two biggest groups in that, I already mentioned financials, just a shade under 30%. Industrials are the second biggest, let's say 13%. So financials and industrials are the biggest part of the the value universe. Okay. And I think that's, uh, so money's beginning to flow into that area. 
And I think it's a sign of some, some optimism. And I also think, you know, we have been complaining for months, all of us, that the weakness in tech, uh, transportation stocks, the weakness in um, small cap stocks, now we're starting to see them rally. And by the way, they are economically sensitive. Uh, the, the transportation sector is very sensitive to the U.S. economy. And that's been very, very strong over the last two or three weeks. And small cap stocks are, are domestic oriented stocks. So if bond yields are starting to rally here and the yield curve uh, strengthens, okay, we get away from this recession talk, people become a little more confident. I think they'll start moving money into these more economically sensitive areas. So I think it's a good sign. Yeah, I would just throw in there too, you mentioned the transports, trucking uh, breaking out almost to a 52 week high now, uh, can't hurt either. Exactly. Very. These are all, uh, you know, the old the old Dow theory. Uh, you want the Dow industrials and the transports to be moving in the same direction. They have not been moving in the same. They've been moving in opposite directions this year. Uh, you know, the industrial companies make the goods. This is the whole Dow theory. And the transport the transport companies, the rails and the truckers, they move the goods. So they should be moving in, in the same direction. And right now they seem to be. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right. Uh, what else you got for us? Uh, let's go back to uh, let's go back to the you have the market message list there. Or, um, the list. We, Let me find that. Look at, that. We could look at this. this. This is just something. Oh. Here you go. You know, let's go back. Let's go back to the transportation. Let's look at that. September the 10th. OK. Since Tom mentioned transports, we may as well look at it. Absolutely. Which, Pictures worth a thousand words, Aaron, as you know, right? <laughs> you know, you could just show these pictures and play music and people would probably get the same idea. Mm -hmm. I, wrote on, uh, I wrote this. I know I'm not the first one. A lot of us have been writing about this. Uh, uh, the blue bars, uh, the, <laughs> the black bars, yeah, that's the Dow Jones transports. And as you know, they've been lagging. By the way, that, okay, you can see the chart. See that that solid line on that chart? Uh, we have the blue uh, the, uh, the blue logo. That's the Dow transports divided by the Dow industrials. That's a relative strength ratio. And you can see how weak the transports have been relative to the industrials, and that's not a good sign. But if you look to the far right over the last uh, two weeks or so, the transports have really erupted. They bounced off their June low. This chart is through Monday, um, but I, I looked at it and we are, I looked at it today. We're right in the process of testing that trend line there drawn over the, uh, April, July highs, you can see that. We're stalling there a little bit, but I, I, have, a, I have a strong feeling we're gonna go through that because as Tom mentioned, trucking stocks, rail stocks, they're all, they're all beginning to look, uh, oh, there you go. Yeah. Actually, we're, we got above it yesterday, we pulled back and we're a teeny bit above it now. I think we're gonna go through that. The chart just looks bullish to me. And when I look at uh, the stocks, that uh, Tom mentioned trucking stocks, uh, they're also looking very good. So this is an economically sensitive group. They've been lagging behind. Um, I, I'd be willing to bet if you put bond yields over that, you'd probably see a correlation. But anyway, that's a bit of a reach. So a transportation stock. So that would put transportation stocks back in sync with the, uh, the Dow Industrials. And for the first time in several months, the transports are actually doing better than the utilities. And I think that's a very, very good sign. We can move down to come with some of the other charts, Aaron. Um, there you go. Tom mentioned trucking stocks right on cue. Uh, <laughs> Tom, you've been reading my stuff, or have I been reading your stuff? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you gave away my secret. <laughs> great, 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 great. Think alike. Well, we, we know how to read charts. That's the main thing. This is uh, CHR Robinson Worldwide. You can see it breaking that trend line. Um, very nice. Uh, that's a very nice chart. If you go down a little bit further, you can see the same thing. Uh, JBHT. What I, I do, what Tom does, I look at the various groups. And when I looked earlier in the week, I looked at the Dow Jones, um, what do you call it, the trucking index, and it was it was breaking out to the upside. So I went to the individual stocks, and here they are. JBH Transport Services, another very nice breakout to the upside. And I think there's one more that we can go very good. Landstar, as you can see, uh, also, uh, well, no, no, we don't have to be a shard expert to see these things. They're, they're obviously starting to rise. They're breaking through some major trend lines. And of course, trucking stocks are very closely tied to the economy because when people want to move goods around the country, they hire trucks, 
they hire rails, whatever. So this is a very good sign. Also, I just wanted to uh, show one more chart in this group, uh, Aaron. Mm -hmm. If you can move down. There we are. Uh, this is Kirby. Uh, this is something, the marine transportation. This is a, uh, this is a group I, I hardly ever look at. We always look at the airlines. We look at the rails, the trucks, the delivery service. This is something that, but it jumped out. It was the strongest, one of the strongest groups. And I look beneath the surface and here's Kirby. I don't think I've ever shown a chart of this before. Uh, marine transportation. I'm not even sure I know what that means. It has something to do with ships, I guess, but, uh, you can see Kirby turning up very sharply and had another very strong day yesterday. So these are all uh, doing very well. And then as long as we're on it, let's just go to the last two. Remember, this was written on Monday, so it's a little dated now. I just wanted to show that um, while we're beginning to see money moving into transportation stocks, notice that the utility stocks uh, are starting to break down. Bear in mind that over the last several months, utilities have been the strongest, transports have been the weakest, the fact that utilities are now, I'm not saying they're breaking down, but they're starting to weaken. That line along the top, by the way, that red line on the top there, chart six, that is a ratio of the utilities divided by the transports. And you can see utilities have been the dominant force, again, tied to falling bond yields, rising bond prices. Over the last week, I won't say a dramatic turn, but a very noticeable turn to the downside that utilities are beginning to underperform transports that would seem to support the idea that bond yields might be bottoming here. And we're beginning to see a little bit of rotation out of bonds back into stocks. And then I think there's one more there, Aaron. There you go, right on the queue. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't resist showing this because REITs and utilities move in the same direction and for the same reasons, they're dividend paying stocks. And you can see that breaking down as well. And Aaron, I lied. I do have one more chart. I never, I never end on the number seven. I always <laughs> have one more. This is, I just, I don't know why I showed this. I just thought it was interesting. This was Monday. This is the Dow Jones Composite at, at, uh, Index average. This includes the three Dow averages. Uh, there were 30, let me see if I got this right, 30 industrials, 20 transports, and 15 utilities. And you can see it, it, it looks pretty much like the Dow chart. We bounced off the 200 day moving average back in August, very nice. We rose above the 50 day moving average last week, which is very nice. So it, it looks good, it looks positive, it looks like we're gonna test the highs, but the, the point I was trying to make in showing this chart is that beneath the surface, we know the industrials broke out last week, but what I found encouraging is that for the first time, utilities are not leading this higher utilities are a defensive group. It's being led higher by transportation stocks and industrial stocks at this point. And I thought that you can't see it on the chart, but beneath the surface, I think that that's a positive sign. All right, John, I can't let this go without asking this question. <laughs> uh, you said something about you don't end on chart seven. Is that, what is that all about? Well, when I'm writing, there is certain numbers I just don't like to end on. If, I, if I'm writing a message and I see I'm on chart seven, I have to put in it. I either have to erase a chart or put in and put in a chart eight. I just can't. I can't end on. I can't end on numbers like seven or nine or eleven. So I don't know why. It's <laughs> it's a fib, and I like ending on Fibonacci numbers. So eight is a good. Thing. There you go. That's what it is. A lot of subliminal messages here, uh, Tom. <laughs> Now I got to adopt something else of yours. This is uh, this is making it tough on me, John. <laughs> I got to stay one step ahead of you, Tom. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you? Let me ask you. One, I, let me, I'm not saying I do it, but I try. <laughs> let me ask you one one final question. There was actually a question that came into the room earlier about the uh, growth and value we were talking about earlier, and the question is: Do we think that growth and value can go up simultaneously? Can they both go up together? What are your thoughts there? Uh, I don't see any reason why they can, but I think they go at different rates, you know, uh, right. and, and, and you know, Tom, that uh, there's been a little discussion, but you and I had this earlier today about what this means. Uh, and I've read, uh, I've heard a lot of people uh, say that, um, well, this is a sign of caution in the market, but maybe it is to a certain extent, people want to put money to work and rather than chase technology stocks, for example, which have been market leaders all year, they're looking around for areas that provide more value. They're cheaper, uh, and I think I think that's a good sign. And also, one other little thing that uh, I think you pointed this out uh, that the last couple of times we've seen this rotation, uh, the stock market sold off. 
Am I, am I right about that, Tom? Yes. You, you, mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I've thought about that. The only thing I think, again, this time may be different, I hate saying that, is that the last two times that we saw that rotation out of growth into value, it had to do more with selling in the technology sector. Technology is the biggest part of growth by far. Um, uh, and uh, that was that was what caused those rotations. This time, the rotation, I won't even say out of growth, but into value, more money is flowing into value, has more to do with the fact that financial stocks are turning up. Technology stocks haven't turned down. They're, they're, they're lagging a little bit, but they're still holding up okay. Nothing's breaking down, really. But money is flowing into financial stocks, and they are, again, the biggest part of the, the value universe. So this time may be a little bit different, and I, I think that's a more positive message. And the fact that the rally is starting to broaden out financial stocks, cyclical stocks, small cap stocks, transportation stocks, I think that's a good sign. Yeah, I would agree. And I think, too, um, you know, you said earlier, it's always good to have those transportation stocks going up because that's telling us one thing. It's telling us that obviously there's more goods to be shipped. The market's looking forward, likes what it sees. And I think the last time you were on the show, we pulled up a couple charts and showed that when small caps are moving to the upside and transportation is moving to the upside, that tends to coincide with some of the biggest moves in the S&P 500. So I'm very encouraged by the two of them beginning to show some strength and leadership again. Uh, I would definitely agree with that, Tom. So uh, we may see some, uh, we're going to see some money shifting around in here. But I think the, the biggest story is that I think money is going to start coming out of bonds, some profit taking at least. And some of that money is going to find its way back into the stock market. It's just a matter of where that money goes. Some of it right now is going. Well, financial stocks are the biggest beneficiary of rising bond yields. So it, it does make sense. Absolutely. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you on here, my friend. Look forward to having you back soon. And uh, I guess we'll sit back and see what the Fed does next week. Absolutely. Well, we already know what they're going to do, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. Maybe they don't know, but we know. But we, <laughs> we know what they should do, but I know you've been watching. I mean, the market, the you know, those three Fed meetings, the one back in December, the one at the end of April, beginning of May, and then again in uh, July, that's when the market took the tumble was after the Fed meeting. So it makes me nervous. And that's actually maybe one more reason why I think some of the folks are getting out of growth right now is maybe the Fed. Maybe it's the Fed a little bit. They're a little nervous mm -hmm. going into this Fed meeting. Yeah, I think so. And um, so the Fed, the Fed, a 50 point rate cut makes no sense at this point with the economy strengthening. And they can't not cut because I think the stock market would take that very badly. So I think a quarter point but the point is, will that make a difference? I think it's pretty much in the market at this point. That may be one of the reasons that uh, bond yields are bouncing because they realize the Fed isn't going to be that that aggressive in cutting rates. Already baked in, as they say. Yeah. Well, hopefully. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't All right. Know. Well, I know. Let's put it that way. That's what the the uh, betting is uh, an eighty nine percent chance of a quarter point cut. So that's pretty good. Mm hmm. I know we've already held you longer than uh, we probably were supposed to, but uh, always a pleasure to have you on here, John, and uh, take care. Have a great rest of your week and see you again soon. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, I tell you what, it's always great to hear from John, find out what he's thinking about the markets. Um, and he's right. I do occasionally look at his articles. Um, <laughs> More than occasionally. Um, but yeah, we have uh, some similar. I, I got to give credit where credit's due, though. I mean, I did study a lot of John's work and it's been his work was very inspirational on a lot of the uh, intermarket stuff that I do. So absolutely. I can see his uh, his touch on a lot of the analysis that you do. So similarly to probably me and, and uh, my dad, Carl. <laughs> no, no doubt. All right, well, we are going to jump into the 10 in 10. We'll probably have to go through these very quickly, or maybe it'll be the uh, 7 in 7. Uh, but let's go ahead, and I'm going to jump in with PayPal first. Um, and PYPL, you know, looking at the chart, you can see that it has begun to erode on a relative basis, which I'm not very happy about. So far, holding on to price support at 102.50. And in what I would consider maybe is a little bit of a bear flag, but that would not confirm until we get a breakdown at 102.50 or so. So I'd probably keep a fairly tight stop in here. Don't like the volume trends. Don't like the way it's been trading relative to its group. So I would be a little careful with it. Again, break below 102.50 would probably have me on the sidelines. All right. The most popular.
popular in the chat room was Intel. Uh, looks like it's trying to break out today. Yeah, it is trying to break out, and semiconductors are trying to break out. They're not far, and uh, Dave Keller was talking about this yesterday and the fact that he really likes the relative strength and what's going on in semiconductors, and I cannot disagree with him at all. Um, Intel has not been one of the better performers, but it did put in a relative uh, double bottom here, starting to strengthen. I think clearing that uh, high, that relative high back in May would be really important, so I'm just going to annotate that particular line. But if we could get back through that uh, that reaction high right there um, and begin to show strength, kind of like Micron did. Micron's been showing a lot of strength uh, recently, and it did start to show on the relative strength chart first. And uh, so that's why I'd watch for on Intel. But a break uh, really above that that high right here uh, back in July, we're right right at that level. That would be very bullish and could help us fill that gap all the way back to 57. All right, the next one up is Rio. Rio Tinto? Indeed. I want to go to Rio. <laughs> that's a different Rio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely a different Rio. All right, uh, Rio Tinto. Um, we're breaking above the 50. That's good news. The volume is really coming out of it, although today's not bad. This is actually, you know, volume still got uh, half the day left. Um, but the overall volume has been moving down as it's been trying to get through. I think we have some overhead resistance, gap resistance that we have to deal with here. So I'm just going to draw those two lines in. That's where we were before the big – look at this volume down here as we went into this tailspin. I think that in this area is your overhead resistance. So yes, we're getting through the 50 day. I wanna see some volume come in and actually see this thing close above 55. I would start to feel a little bit better about the stock if, uh, if it could do that. All right, here is, honestly, I look at this and see parabolic all over it. MGI, MoneyGram International. Um, yeah, I don't like the big reversal so far today. We'll see how it finishes. But yeah, this is one of those stocks I think you definitely want to keep a trailing stop in play if you're if you're trading it um, because it can because it's gone up so fast. I mean, it was $2 in July. Now it hits a high today of 670. It's at 601. You can see the volatility. There's no way if I wasn't already in this and uh, and continuing to keep a trailing stop, there's no way I would be buying the stock. I think uh, what I would be looking for if I was looking for entry, I'd have to see a very quick tumble and then Keep in mind that this is an extremely volatile stock, but if I got a test of that rising 20-day moving average at some point, kind of like we saw back at the beginning of August, went down, gap just below it, and then took off from there, that would be one thing to look for. Also, let's keep in mind that this breakout right here above that June high comes in just below four. So I think four to 450. Now we're talking about a stock that's 601, but it was 670 earlier today. That's how quickly the stock can move in both directions. I'd have to wait. Uh, and see lower prices before think even considering entry. Absolutely. Okay. Um, how about Meritage Homes, MTH? Yeah, love this stock. Home builders, even with interest rates uh, going up, uh, home builders continue to perform well. And this one has been one of the leaders, as you can see over here on the relative charts. So this is one that I own. I actually like this stock a lot. Um, but you know, when you when I look at the charts again, I like looking from left to right and seeing all this strength, everything moving up from left to right, that is generally a really good sign. And you can see that is across the board, um, looking at how the stock trades relative to its peers, to the S&P 500, how its peers uh, trade versus the S&P 500. You can see the huge volume on the gap up with earnings. I, I like this one. All right, how about CVS uh, in that pharmaceutical space seems to be waking up. Yeah, um, CVS, you know, I, I think in the short term looked good. I'm not sure the longer term. I think there's some major overhead resistance. And again, I want to watch the volume and see if it continues to accelerate. We are showing some relative strength versus the pharmas. Um, I would just say this. If, if I was in this one, I'd want to make sure, just like we saw at the end of August, that, that uh, test of the 20-day moving average, uh, that held. I would want to make sure any future tests like that hold as well. So you can see there, a couple of days later, again, any kind of a pullback to test that 20-day, and then again, maybe price support. After getting to 62, we fell back to 58 and change, back through 62. Would have liked to have seen a little bit more volume on that breakout. I would just be watching this, this support level because we are still in a longer-term downtrend, even though short-term, we're beginning to see some strength. So 
I just advise maybe a little bit of caution there. And uh, why don't we do one more, Aaron, before we wrap up the show? All right, but we'll stop on number seven. Oh, <laughs> all right. That would, that would be Shopify. It took a hit the last two days, like uh, three days, like a lot of the others. Yeah, I still like the stock. I mean, yes, it, it uh, definitely has taken a hit. All of software, if you're looking at software stocks, just about every software stock got hit. So when you yeah. look at a, a leading stock like Shopify, I think it's a little misleading when you think, oh, this stock's not performing well. Well, the whole group got sold off really hard. Um, the volume was big, but I see it coming back up here above the 50-day. And what I really like is that it remains one of the leaders in software. So I'm okay, and we got to do the eighth one. Uh, just okay, how about Yum C? All right. Yum C. So that's Yum China. I believe so. I can't get my computer to work yep. for me here. Um, I like the stock. I like the space. I just don't like it right now because it's up against pretty important price resistance as it gets close to this 48 level. You can see we failed in May. We failed again in July, and now we're up against it. I'm going to need to see some more volume and a breakout. I do like this pattern, higher highs, or excuse me, equal highs, higher lows off of an uptrend. I think this is a really nice pattern, but if we fail here, I think you might have one more opportunity at the 20-day moving average. All righty, and uh, that will do it then. <laughs> yes, thanks to John. I had to go to the eighth one. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, there are the stocks that uh, just were covered in the 10 in 10. And Aaron, what do you think the Fed's going to do? We got about 30 seconds. What do you think the Fed does? Oh, now? I think it's going to, they're going to go with the uh, quarter percent drop. Yeah. 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 I'm in that camp as well. I think they're going to do a quarter percent. I'm actually a little, I'm not going to say uh, that I'm, I differ from John's view, but I wouldn't be upset with a half point cut. Um, and the reason being, I think that the Fed got way behind the curve um, I believe cutting short-term rates by a half point would help uh, with that inverted yield curve even further. I think that would be great for financials. I don't know. That's my thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, well, I think we're going to get the quarter. I think that's what we'll get. Anyway, I want to thank all of you for being with us today. Again, we apologize for the issues at the beginning of the show. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1 p.m. Have a great Thursday afternoon, everybody. See you tomorrow. Happy trading.